Uh, Valentino giving me suits, gangsters. You have a brother who has served 36 years in prison. Per the law, he was eligible for, for parole years ago, six years ago, right? Yeah. So if the law states that he is eligible for compassion after the serving 30 years in prison, then why wouldn't they give it to him? Yet they have denied him nine times. That's unheard of, right, in the federal system. This is an old law prisoner who deserves to come home, who is deathly ill. It is a great honor and privilege to be standing here before all of you to ask for the immediate compassionate release of Dr. Matulu Shakur. Having my mentor, Susan Rosenberg, to tell me about who he was and who he is over the years since my release from federal prison allowed me to understand uh, why it was important for us to advocate and make sure that I was standing here for young people like me to make sure that we're forcing everything and every might that we have to make sure that Dr. Matulu Shakur is released from federal prison today. Today, the actions that was taken on behalf of the Free Matulu Shakur Committee, Support Committee, was they delivered a petition that was signed by over 200 faith leaders to be delivered to the Department of Justice, the rural prisons, and the uh, Parole Commission on behalf of Matulu Shakur, the purpose of which is to get Matulu Shakur compassionate relief. We recognize that this government has a selective amnesia when it comes to compassion. Uh, for example, John Hinckley got compassion. Matula Shakur's uh, co-defendant has gotten compassion. Why do you think they're so reluctant to give him compassion uh, with all the great works he's done? Well, that's, you probably hit it on the head. Uh, the great works lead to stature. And stature means that people see you, people admire you, you have an influence, you have an impact just by your presence. And that's what he has, an impact just by his presence. And that makes the system fearful, particularly a system that wants to basically control the narrative, control the message, control the image. It makes that system very harsh and, 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 and evil in terms of the way they treat somebody. He has acknowledged his uh, crimes and he has shown compassion and um, asked for forgiveness for that. And so in this moment, um, due to his medical state, like we said, his weight was around 125. He has combined to a wheelchair and he's been moved to the medical ward of the federal prison institution. Which one? Which Prison. Oh, he's currently located in Lexington, um, Kentucky. He's important because when I did have the opportunity to meet him while he was incarcerated decades later, he was still committed to the betterment of black people. And not just black people, but those communities who are marginalized and forgotten about. And he did it so selflessly. Like, he didn't just stop once incarcerated. He organized, he created peaceful places where our people were. And I thought that that was just necessary. So why could I not be acting? on his behalf. See, my background is daughter of veterans, both parents, family of veterans. I believe every war fought in this country. I have had family in that war. And so to see that there were conditions in the country that we needed to address, drug issues, like drug abuse, housing issues, literacy, access to food. And this man who has then did not let his situation and circumstances stop that commitment made me say, hey, we must be active and do something about that. Currently, like on small factors, Baba Matulu is 71 years old. In two weeks, he will be 72. His birthday is August 8th. So age alone, he is eligible for, as an aging elder, he's eligible for a compassionate release. And then on top of that, you add his health conditions. He's dealing with stage three bone marrow cancer. He um, it did not go into remission. He got he received treatments and it's not there. He's dealing with, he has gotten COVID three times. So during this pandemic, that was even like early releases of COVID releases and he did not meet the commands of that. Then on top of that, he is basically now given a six months timeline and this was months ago. So all we're stuck with that number of six months we're talking three months maybe even six weeks it's a very day to day we have to do this now and so i just believe as 
I believe in dignity. I believe in what these like sitting in Washington D.C., the capital of this nation, that we are supposed to stand on these principles. He has served his time. He should be allowed to die with dignity amongst us. And that's even hor- sad to say because like he's been incarcerated since I was three years old. Never know which way pathway my was. He has family. He has grandkids. And so I think like with his time served, with his eligibility for parole ten times in this moment he meets the declaration of compassionate release and thus we should do that it's a humane thing to do it's a dignity like dignified thing to do and it's um yeah the DLJ has that power to do that in in light of everything that we've already established that he meets the criteria for compassion I would like to for y'all to dial down on why are they so reluctant to uh, acknowledge these accomplishments because parole been denied and he, he frisked the criteria for parole so he should have been released what is the, what is the opposition what are, what are the, uh, the institutions offering in opposition to why they don't want to they claim they state that he is a danger to public safety a danger to society and that he has the capacity to influence uh, many people that is what their rationale is they don't speak to the fact that he's a 71 year old elder they don't speak to the fact that he has uh, been incarcerated for 36 years. They don't speak to the fact that he has, yes, he has influenced, very positively influenced so, so, so many young black men in prison to turn their lives around and to be about, um, um, you know, being productive. They don't speak about those, um, uh, uh, those things. So it is vindictiveness. I submit there's racial disparity involved in it, as I spoke um, earlier, because it's not the nature necessarily of the crime, because other people committed um, offenses that the United States considers as uh, crime, but have been let home, and have been let home under compassionate release to die peacefully with family and friends. So we need, that's why the call to action must be. We need to really raise our collective voices Okay, so that we are heard, so that we are heard in the halls of the Department of Justice, so that we are heard in the halls of Congress, so that we are heard in the corridors of the White House. That is what is going to free Dr. Matulu Shakur. They're putting all these black people in jail. And most of these people, even though they were doing very self-destructive stuff, But I can tell you on a case-by-case basis that the people who are getting 25, 30, 40 years in jail, the majority of them coming down from the project from the seventh floor, somebody gave them a bag of rocks and said, if you stay in here every day from four to seven, I'll give you and your mama $200. You give me what's in the bag back never been off their block, don't know what a lawyer is. And these people are in this jail, or in these jails, especially the federal jail, all over America. These are not a hard thing to get in. Crack cells. But there's no woodworking job, there's no construction, there's no hanging of no wires no more. Everybody's got cellular phones. There's no putting up poles. There's the mundane labor that we used to have in the 50s, 60s, and there, there's no no. They're selling crack out of a bag, and that's not encouraging. But these people are going to jail for 30 and 40 years. And you know what? I have, I've been in jail almost 13, 14 years. And these people have been in there longer. And we have not seen a black congressional representative come into these jails since I've been in there. There's no excuse for that. Where's the individual responsibility? There has been no black representative that I have seen. And I got a loud mouth, I'm always in something, that has been into these institutions. They don't allow black history to come into these institutions. So if, who is fighting that? When they took sex books out of the prison, when they took a penthouse and, and, and Playboy and all of that out of the prison, you have to know, and uh, Bob Cachalon or whatever his name is, they got together and they paid their lawyers and said, you get in there and you fight for us to sell those sex books to those prisoners. 
And I ain't mad at it. Because they fought. They fought. We, the right for us to have an interview because of the Mendendez brothers or some other issue out on the West Coast about a uh, Charlie Manson issue. They're going to prevent people from having direct communication with the press? Who's fighting that? Is it just sitting there? Is the, the ACLU fighting that? Is the Amnesty International fighting that? Uh, what are we really saying when we're talking about fighting for political prisoners? What are we really saying about when we talk about fighting the power or having access to, you know, what is it that we're really saying? Uh, Valentino giving me suits.